each day be a good day. Uh, I know that, as Sandy was sharing those words, that all of our hearts related to that, because most certainly we would like each day to be a good day. And as I was <clears throat> looking at our program this morning and looking at this title of Sandy's solo, I was thinking that, you know, it's interesting if you think about it, if you're aware of it, and I'm sure that, as I remind you, you will be aware of it, that you can hardly go to any market, any store, any place where you have, are served or by whomever, uh, that the person doesn't say, have a good day, have a good afternoon, or have a good evening. And you know, it's interesting, that has really become a dominant part of uh, the responsiveness of just life. That people, and you know, I thought, well, even if we say that, or if it is said with just sort of <clears throat> as a glib response, in, but, in, but in truth, that individual is really giving a blessing because they are at least are projecting a positive idea. And so next time that someone says, have a good day or have a good evening or a good afternoon, whatever it is, think about it and realize, hey, that person has just given you, uh, has directed this great creative law that we're going to uh, talk about this morning for greater good for your life. And most certainly we want each day to be a good day. And guess what? Sometimes we have good days and sometimes they're not so good days. But that's because we're all a part of, a, of states of consciousness and we're all part of a growth process. And I have a lot of ideas I want to share this morning. And here I am and doing my annual <clears throat> uh, January review, reviewing the basic principles of the science of mind. Some people get bored with that, but guess what? As I was working with these ideas, and most certainly, I could almost say that I almost know that textbook by heart because I've taught it for 17 years and I've been reading it for, for year, many years longer than that. At any rate, as I was working with chapter two in the Science of Mind textbook, how it, does it, how it works, I truly uh, was feeling by the time that I put some thoughts down on paper, which of course I've redone, but at any rate, I had a feeling of humility, a feeling of awe, and a feeling of gratitude. And if you would really get involved with that, uh, those first four chapters in the Science of Mind textbook, I know that it would generate those feelings within you. Because when we begin to even understand, it just in a small degree, the givingness of God, and the love of God, and this great creative power, the creative action, this uh, law that we, that we call a law of God, and as we begin to understand how it works for us and through us and in our world of experience, it really is awesome. And I suppose that's why Ernest Holmes makes the statement in the textbook that we should not approach this thing with fear, but perhaps with humility, with awe, but not a sense of unworthiness. And you know, that statement is a powerful statement because it does give you a sense of awe. And as we begin to develop our understanding of these principles and that they're universal, they're cosmic, they don't play favorites, they work for all alike according to the way that individual consciousness uh, works it, that as we begin to understand that, we begin to know that the great love of God has given each one of us the opportunity to not ever have to be stuck. And you know, that's really wonderful. That is freedom that we do not have to be stuck in any situation, any circumstance, any set of events, and or in any states of consciousness. And indeed, we would like every day to be a good day, and we are here because we'd like to get our life together, and we would like our life to be filled with wholeness and peace and happiness and joy. And we have a right to that. And we experience that when we can, in the very subjective level of our being, know that and sense that we're not unworthy of the greatness of life, of the desires of your heart, of being able to have every day be a good day and filled with love. Now, one of the reasons that every day isn't this great, fantastic, wonderful day, however, maybe your day is, but it appears that sometimes it isn't, and that is because Ernest Holmes makes a statement that to reshape our thoughts takes time. And that's exactly what you and I are doing we are reshaping our thoughts because we are learning that thought is the catalyst for this creative power and that this law, this creative action, this creative intelligence acts upon our thoughts, responds to our thoughts and or our states of consciousness. 
And again, I want to define consciousness as individually, it is what I think and what I feel. That is my state of consciousness. And, and during all these years of studying and trying to get my act together, I have been in the process of reshaping my thoughts. But that indeed has taken time. And I will continually unfold and be in the process of reshaping my thoughts. Because as we develop our spiritual awareness, as we work with these ideas, as we work with this technique, as we work with meditation and spiritual mind treatment, we are in the process of constantly, continually reshaping our thoughts. And you know, the thing itself, and I would like to, again, this morning, just reiterate from last week that what the Ernest Holmes statement about the essence of the study of the science of mind. He says it is the study of life and the nature of law governed and directed by thought. You see, prior to coming into this, and perhaps you too, I didn't know my thought had anything to do with my life or my experiences. I thought God did it or they did it. I didn't know it had anything to do with my thinking and or my feeling or my consciousness. And so here we are, the study of life and the nature of law governed and directed by thought, always conscious that we live in a spiritual universe, that God is in, through, around, and for us. That's what this study is all about. It's a study of the nature of life, the principles uh, the, the nature of the laws and the principles that are universal but are applicable to every person individually and that they're neutral, they're impersonal, this creative law, this creative power, this power for good that we can use. It is neutral, it is impersonal, it doesn't play favorites, it is available and it's mechanically accurate. And so it's, it seems as if during all the, the study of the textbook and, and uh, Troward and the different books that we study as we are taking classwork so that we can have a greater understanding, it seems that there's an, a lot of attention focused upon law. Law, law, law. But again, we, we want to always be conscious that we live in a spiritual universe and that God is in, through, around, and more than anything else for us. As we develop our spiritual consciousness, our relationship with this indwelling presence, this indwelling God, and this great creative action of God, we become more aware that God is for us. And what we learn is that you and I must learn how to be for ourselves. And you'll say, well, gee, I'm for myself. Not necessarily. At least in my own growth process, my I was certainly was conditioned by my environment, by the peers in my world, and I accepted messages that were limiting and were indeed false. And so to reshape my thought, it does take time. And I've been in the process of reshaping my thought for a long time in terms of being able to accept that yes, indeed, I am worthy of working with this creative power, with this creative intelligence, that I am worthy of working with the concepts and the ideas that in the beginning God, absolute intelligence, created all that is, and that includes you and that includes me. That we're created in and of God. That we are an expression of God. That we are a perfect thought of God. And that perfect thought of God is a part of the spiritual development that you and I are endeavoring to embody. Ernest Holmes makes a wonderful statement. He says that our conviction and our feelings are the way that we use or uh, this creative power or is the creative action within us. Our conviction means our beliefs. What I am convinced is the truth. And we discover that we have been convinced of certain ideas and concepts that were the truth that were false. And it's not easy to undo those false beliefs. But my convictions and what we do is that through our self-realization, self-discovery, our spiritual journey, we begin to change those false, limited ideas and convictions. And you know, there's that old cliche that a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And that is the truth. And I've discovered that there is something that's rebellious and resistant and stubborn within all of us. And often we want to resist the truth. We, and we resist the very ideas and the very, uh, of, of the very things that you and I desire 
in the very heart of our hearts to experience. So, we eat, there's no one that can convince you of what the truth is for you or that you are worthy and that you deserve until you or I can come into this inner feeling. Yes, this is a truth. So, our convictions and our feelings are the way we use this creative power. And so life is according to our belief system. And again, as the great teacher Jesus said, that it is done unto us as we believe. You know, this creative, and then Ernest Holmes makes a statement that that word as symbolizes heaven and hell. It is done unto you and to me as I believe. If I believe in limited, uh, limited concepts, then it's hell. And you know, the creative process this, that we all use is involution, evolution, that it always works from the invisible, from, from thought which is invisible, into that world of visibility, into the world of effect, manifestation, or form. So the creative process is what I am involved with in my thought and feeling, and that evolves into my world of experience. So the creative process <clears throat> also is involution is heaven or hell. Involution is the way I use cause. And evolution is how it was what I experience. So involution, evolution is the way it all works. It always works from the inside and moves into the outside. And that's why when you and I pray and treat and we say that we have to, we know that the answer, the healing, the demonstration is right here, right now. And you look around you, hey, it's invisible. But all things work from the invisible side of life and move into visibility. So we work with ideas. We work with thoughts, and we work with feelings, and that's how this creative process works. And so it appears sometimes that we are fooling ourselves and saying, let's just say that we have a physical challenge, and that we're saying that there is only one body of God, there is one life, that life is God, that life is perfect, and that life is my life right here and right now. And it may seem that we are kidding ourselves, but if this creative process indeed works from idea or thought into experience, and it does, or if it, if it works from the invisible into visibility, then we better focus our attention on the answer rather than on the problem. And this is what, why it takes time to reshape our thoughts. Because so much of our, the energy of our thought is focused upon the have-nots. It's focused upon the problems, the situations, the fears, um, the, the, the troubles that trouble our hearts. And then guess what? That which we focus our attention upon is acted upon by this neutral, available, mechanically accurate, creative power. It uh, responds to you and to me according to our, again, conviction and feelings. And therefore, if we want to know what our convictions and our beliefs really are, then we, all we have to do is to look at our world of experience. Now, in this, there is no judgment, but it is a way, and perhaps the only way, that you and I can know where we need to reshape our thoughts, where we need to stand in correction. And so the thing itself is absolute intelligence, and the way it works is through an absolute, mechanically accurate, immutable, impersonal law. And whether we were aware of it or not, or understand it or not, that's just the way it is. As we, with all our getting, get a greater degree of understanding, we begin to learn how to think, to learn how to reshape our thinking, and indeed to begin to participate in the healing process of our world of experiences, physically, mentally, emotionally, and environmentally. And so, we are here again to learn how to think, because that is the way we learn how to live. One of the, in that first uh, chapter in the Science of Mind textbook, The Thing Itself, Ernest Holmes ends that chapter uh, with a statement that I didn't get to last week, but I want to share it with you this morning because it's been very, very meaningful to me in this process of reshaping my thoughts, my beliefs, my feelings, and my convictions. And that statement is, God is always God no matter what our emotional storm or objective situation may be. 
It doesn't matter what hell we're going through, what emotional storm we're going through, what that experience is out there. God is always God. Principles never change. God has never deserted us, left us, abandoned us. And you know, there is that little statement you've all heard, if God seems far away, who moved? <coughs> and often we do move out of the shadow of the Almighty. And therefore, sometimes that experience, that effect, that problem pushes us back under the shadow of the Almighty, back into the awareness, the conscious recognition that God is always God and God has never changed its nature and that there in the beginning God created all that is and called it good. And so our whole <clears throat> experience in reshaping our lives is through reshaping our thoughts through the technique of prayer, meditation, spiritual mind treatment. And next week I'll get more into the technique of that. This morning I really did want to focus again on the way it works. And one of the ideas that is presented to us, and you've heard it through in many writings, is that the way God works for us is by working through us. That, you know what, the thing is that even God cannot give us something that you and I cannot or will not accept. And that made a lot, it was important to me, that statement, when I embodied it, that God cannot give us anything that we cannot accept because the acceptance is through what? My conviction, my faith, my belief system, and my emotions, my feeling nature. And so even God cannot give us a, a, a healing, a demonstration, happiness, love, uh, that right position, whatever that is, unless you and I can accept it. So the, one of the purposes, one of the focus, one of the thrusts of spiritual mind treatment is to move our consciousness into an into a higher awareness of acceptance, of faith, of conviction, of belief, and of feeling that I am one with my answer, that the answer already is. And so there is this great creative power that responds to each one of us according to that, to our convictions, our beliefs, and our, our feelings, our, our emotional responses. But we don't have to stay stuck, as I said earlier. And we can move out of whatever that situation is, through a reshaping, a changing of our thoughts, our attitudes, our feelings, getting back to principle. Always, you know, my first teacher said, when you're in trouble, go back to principle. And I've been in trouble plenty of times, and I remember that, go back to principle. What is principle? Perfect God, perfect man, perfect being. In the beginning, God. And that we are it, God expressed as individualized, beingness. In him we live and move and have our being. What is him? It is this great essence, this great energy, this great wholeness, this great spirit. And that's what principle is. When you're in trouble, go back to principle. Harmony and order, the nature of God, intelligence, peace. My peace give I unto thee. We don't find a lot of peace in the world. Where you and I find peace is in our hearts, in this union, in this communion, in our prayers, in our oneness. Then guess what happens? That consciousness of peace moves through us. God works for us. The law works for us by working through us. It moves through us into our world of experience and touches the people, the situations, and the events of our world. Always but always it moves through us. And that's why it's so important. You know, I was thinking this morning, and I shared a little bit in our pre-church, in our, medit our healing meditation time this morning. I was thinking that we should be so grateful, that we are so fortunate, that we are so privileged to come together on a Sunday morning. That we should, and, and you know why, and, that, and as I share this, I was thinking with those, somebody's going to sit there and say, that lady is really crazy. But I'll tell you why. We are a united consciousness. We are focusing our attention on ideas of wholeness and truth and of God and of spirit and of principle and, and God's laws and in God's nature. And we create an energy here that it, together. And that energy touches each one of us individually and collectively. And as I was thinking about these ideas and concepts, I thought, you do make a difference. So often in this lack of self-knowing, uh, not feeling worthy, we feel, I'm a nothing and I don't make a difference in this world. Absolutely you do. And you make a difference when you're here on a Sunday morning because your energy, your consciousness, your attention, your focus, 
generates a higher level of light and we all participate in that, experience that, are touched by that. And that's why when you leave Sunday, uh, usually, I hope, anyhow, for the most part, that you feel uplifted, energized, you feel good, you have a sense of peace, at least momentarily, and we do take that with us into our world of experience. Now, that world out there may darken it again, and we may just fall back down, but we know we can get up again. And therefore, it is really wonderful to be here. You know, the people out there that want to be healed, that want answers, they should be here. But I can't convince them that. A man convinced against the wills of the same opinion still. But I just wanted to share that with you this morning. Indeed, I'm not crazy. Indeed, something wonderful happens. There is a transformational energy that touches and embraces and, mo and moves through, moves through each one of us when we unite together and share this, uh, these ideas and, the, uh, and generate that spirit that is within each one of us. Now, I want to talk about the law again, okay? Ernest Holmes makes the statement that the law without direction does nothing. And I think that he means that it does nothing specific. The law without direction does nothing specific. Energy unconnected fails. There's another statement in the textbook. And you and I are the way we are the, that we connect with energy. We are the connector. And it is through our minds and our feelings and our words and our attitudes and our belief systems that we make, that we connect with this energy that acts upon and responds, corresponds to our thoughts and our feelings and then moves into our world of effect and experience. Energy unconnected fails. Now, I'm going to tell you about the organ this morning and just to give you a little analogy. As we came in this morning, um, they had moved the organ and the speaker in order to put in the baseboards and the columns there. Anyhow, the organ would not connect. Hans was here because he was practicing with Merle this morning and they were working and plugging in and everything and trying to make it all work. And Merle made the comment, well, it wasn't even plugged in. We went and pulled out the speaker and there has been a loose wire and this, this little thing, I don't know anything about it, looked like it had been pulled out and we shoved it in and pushed it and wriggled it around. Anyhow, nothing happened. So Merle, being a very flexible person, thank God, said, well, I guess I'll just have to do it on the piano this morning. And I said, well, Charles McClellan knows what he, maybe Charles knows. He's put it together before. I said, Louise's husband knows how. And Louise might even have the answer. Anyhow, Charles wasn't here yet. So we went on and I, no. Then uh, uh, Gretchen came and, uh, they, and Bill and they all came in. Everybody is fooling around with this. And then Martha, came in, and this is just before Charles came, and we all looked at, everybody's looking at the wires, you know, and I'm standing here, I'm doing my little meditation, a healing thing, and I said, well, I know there's an answer, but I guess we don't know it. Just then, Martha, for some reason, some reason, intelligence, decided that, well, maybe uh, that th there's two plugs down there, and there's three places to insert them, three connecting places, that maybe she would take this one plug and put it in another outlet. When she did, Merle, t I was behind the organ. Merle says, push that button towards you. I pushed it, and it, it, its power came on. Now, energy unconnected fails. We had it connected improperly. And so guess what? Sometimes we feel that we have an improper connection, or we have no connection at all. And sometimes we connect with an energy that is limiting, that is negative, and that doesn't support us in, in a, uh, an advancement, an unfolding in greater good. So, you and I are the, at the place that energy is connected, and that's our privilege, and it's our, in my opinion, our responsibility to make that connection. You know, the wonderful thing about this neutral power is that there's no one to blame. Now, we all have a belief system that's been conditioned, and that we've accepted beliefs from this great collective unconscious, which means the memory bank since time began, began and also from our environment and authority figures. But we can connect with a higher energy, and that is what prayer is all about. And that there is this great cosmic law that responds to each one of us according to that connection, according to the thoughts, the images, the feelings that we're giving to it. And the wonderful thing is that this law specializes for each one of us individually. 
and that in a sense when you and I are praying or treating or making this connection that when we are connecting when we are entering into that consciousness of wholeness the nature of God it's just as if someone in us is saying yes I will work with you on this healing of this physical situation yes I will work with you I will support you in moving into a new career or a new position yes I will work with you in this and in a in this new relationship or in in developing a greater love or understanding or friendship yes I will work with you and whatever it is that you give to it now isn't that awesome that there's that within you, there's this creative neutral power that is intelligent, all-knowing, knowing what to do and how to do it, not knowing what it does, knowing what to do and how to do it according to our direction. So, this law, this creative power does not do anything specific unless it is directed. Our part is to give it direction, and that is the purpose of spiritual mind treatment, to direct this law, this creative energy, this creative intelligence, that will support us, that will work with us. We're never alone. We're never left on our own, thank God. Then we would be scared. Then our hearts would be troubled. But there is that that is the very love of God that supports us. You've re you, so often you'll read the statement that the universe nurtures us and supports us. And it most certainly does as we open our minds and our hearts to relate to the nature of God expressing throughout this universe and throughout our individual beingness. And so, yes, Ernest Holmes says, if it appears to you or if you think that there is a law specializing just for you, you're correct. It's universal, but it's individualized and it's personal. And it's personal to you and to me according to my thinking and my feeling. And so, prayer treatment and meditation contemplative meditation, whatever it is that you use, is for the purpose of reshaping our thoughts and aligning ourselves with the nature of wholeness. The truth shall set you free. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Ernest Holmes says, provided you know the truth. But I read another statement that he made, and he says that the truth doesn't set us free. It is our alignment, our connection. It is our alignment with the wholeness of God, with the nature of God, which is wholeness and, and physical health, which is harmony and order, which is love and which is peace. It is our alignment with that wholeness that sets us free. Gosh, can't you see why it's so important that we really discipline ourselves to do our treatment work to come to church. You know, I need you, but you need me too, guys, so there. Uh, but anyhow, do you realize the benefits, the rewards, the greatness that develops and moves through us into our world of experience? It takes time to reshape our thoughts. It takes time to move into a consciousness that says, I am going to make my growth process top priority because I accept responsibility, not for my problems, I have no judgment, but I accept responsibility for my cooperation, for my connection with that higher power, a power for good. What a great love this God has for us. All is love and all is law, the essence of this teaching. The great love of God has freed us. You know, love doesn't coerce, it doesn't force, it doesn't manipulate. This great love has freed us to discover the self, the selfhood of God the great Godhead that is the very essence, the very truth of our individual beingness and is a power of love, a love that will never let us go. I hope these ideas this morning have stirred you up, stirred up your energy, stirred up your acceptance, stirred up your selfhood, that you are indeed worthy of the gifts of God. And those gifts are everything that makes life wonderful, worthwhile, and that moves us forward into greater degrees of livingness, beingness, and doingness. Thank you for allowing me to do my thing with you and to share it with you this morning. It's the end of the lesson. Aren't you glad? It's 11.59. Thank you.
Listen, if I can get this excited at, at, for 25 years, what it is about the first four chapters in the textbook, so can you. I think our hostess has brought wonderful uh, goodies for us this morning, Jane and, and uh, um, Marilyn Collins, so do stay out after church, have coffee. I think there's wonderful cake. Or so. I didn't see it, but I heard a rumor, so we can all go see. Let us stand and say, praise God. Thank you.